Well, good morning. Welcome once again back to Glory Baptist Church. Glad that you are here. I'm Pastor Chris Myros, and uh, we're working on getting everything working with the stream. The audio was not playing nice a few minutes ago, but uh, we've got video going out, and hopefully we'll have audio joining it here in a minute. And it's still a learning process as we've been talking. Uh, we just are figuring it out on the fly and doing the very best that we can, and we're thankful for the people who are working hard to make sure that we can share our, our gospel message with the world around us. And so that is a great and glorious and good thing. We had our annual business meeting on uh, Friday and um, talked about a number of things, and that was a good meeting to have. Nothing new in the sense that we haven't changed the budget or anything else like that. Uh, God continues to work through our church. We are praising God that despite the various challenges that have been put before us for the last few months, that great things keep going on. Um, whether it's the ladies finished a bunch of quilts for our graduates, whether it's the various meals that have gone out. Uh, if you've not been here on a Wednesday night, I would encourage you to uh, get a meal, try out the food that Roy's making. He's been doing great food. And uh, Roy is here and Ruth's here. Dan McGuire's been here helping out an awful lot with that. And they're sending out anywhere from 55 to 70 on any given week meals every week. And so you know, we do still have a little more capacity there. I'm not trying to make more work for Roy. But we do have the ability. If you know somebody who would be blessed, they don't have to be Glory Baptist Church people. We have a number of people who have no real association or connection to our church other than knowing us who, who are taking those meals and we're being a blessing to them and we want to be able to be a blessing like that and and so if you know somebody who would benefit from that uh, let us know uh, have them give us a call get get us a food count offer to bring them a meal we we've got folks like jack jack has been driving all over the countryside bringing people food in various weeks right jack and 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 delivering meals to people we have a number of other people who've who've delivered meals to people um, and, and it's just been really a neat thing. Now, it was something we, this is something we've not done in the past. Of course, we've had our Wednesday night meal here where we fed our students and, and some of our families, and that was during the school year. And that, of course, has been great. Many of you have served that. Many of you have probably eaten that, and, and that's been wonderful. But this has really got a, 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 an opportunity to be a bit more far-reaching and more broad-impacting in, in who we are able to be a blessing to. And that's really what it's about. We want to be a blessing. Uh, in this time of, of social distancing and absence and, and feeling like the world is, you know, just not the way we want it to be, we have an opportunity to love people, to serve people, to be a blessing to people. And, and I think that's truly a wonderful thing. And so um, that, that's one of the ways we're doing that. There's a bunch of other things that are going on uh, behind the scenes, whether it's been meals that have been taken to people like Gloria uh, Carlson, if, if you haven't heard, maybe you haven't been here, uh, Gloria had a stroke a couple of weeks ago and then is in recovery and then working through that. Her sister Libby has been uh, now for the last couple of weeks living there with her and, um, and, and, and I got to visit with her on, on Thursday in fact and uh, uh, she's, she's physically doing quite well, um, very impressed in, in, in what the physical therapy is doing. She's, she's still doing a little bit of recovery um, work, particularly with language and speech stuff. That's where she's, her struggles are kind of manifesting for the most part right now, most, most intensely in those areas. And so I um, would encourage you, if you want to visit Gloria, give her a visit. Give them a call ahead of time. It's helpful because during the daytime, she's got various therapists coming. But, but call and say, hey, is it okay if I come at this time? Go on over. Um, and because as Libby and Gloria both said, it's really good for her to be forced to talk and stuff because it's helping her develop and reconnect those things in the brain. And so uh, it's actually a really good thing for her. But uh, do give her a call. And again, thank you for those who've been loving and serving and bringing meals to opportunities like that. And just, just lots of cool things that continue going. Even though for about three months we weren't able to gather, we're still able to be the church because the church is not this building. The church is the people of God, and, and truly, that is a, a great and wonderful and glorious thing, and I am, again, so thankful and appreciative that we have so many people who understand that we are not limited nor defined by the boundaries of a building, that we can continue to bless, we can continue to love, we can continue to serve, 
we can continue to make a difference for Jesus through all of that. And so, uh, again, thank you all for that. Uh, just, there is bulletins and informational items out on the table as you came in if you didn't get them. Some of those would be the normal inserts that we might put in on a Sunday, and uh, things for you to read, um, all, all the different kind of weekly little devotional items. Um, within the listings of the uh, bulletin, of course, is our weekly kind of call to prayer, the different things that we pray over. If you have one of the big copies or if you're looking online on your phone or iPad or whatever it is at home later, uh, you, you'll see that second page will list uh, our verse of the week, our family of the week who are here. Welcome back from Florida, Don and Priscilla. Uh, we didn't get to officially welcome you. I know you've been back for a while, but Don and Priscilla are back from, from Florida and they're living up on Gun Lake where their cabin is. And I, I get to see pictures of all the family that come and visit and all the fun that's going on up there. And so they're our family of the week and make sure you pray for them and keep them in your prayers. Um, there's a bunch of other things just to continue to keep in prayer and, and those are listed on there, whether it's, you know, continue praying for Gloria, pray for the Herd family. Uh, they had their baby boy and he's a happy, healthy, bouncing, beautiful little baby boy. I've gotten to see him a couple times each of the last few weeks and, uh, He's already starting to put some chub on. He's, he's starting to gain weight. He's happy. He's healthy. And if you don't remember that story, I, I don't want to go too deeply into this. But the story is that when um, Adrian was pregnant, they saw a mass in this little baby's lung in utero, right? And, and it was a significant mass, a mass that, that they were very seriously concerned um, was going to deeply impact this little boy's life. So we of course start praying. And uh, this meant that they were gonna have to have the baby in the Twin Cities, and this is in the midst of the COVID crisis, which of course would mean Matt wouldn't be able to, Matt couldn't go into the doctor's appointments um, with this pediatric specialist in the Twin Cities, and just all, all, all those things, right? And so they go in, and at first it's a very, very large mass, and then about a month later, well, the mass isn't so big, but there, there's still a mass in that lung. And uh, still gonna have to have the baby in the cities. Well, then like another month later, um, this is just now a few, what turns out to be about five weeks before the little boy is born. But they're in there, you know, they got the jelly on the belly and they're in there with the ultrasound and they're doing the scanning and, and the ultrasound nurse is like, let me go get another set of eyes, okay. So she goes out and another nurse comes in and they're both in there looking at the screen, you know. If you've ever been through that, my wife had a baby 10 years ago, I got to see it, really cool process. And they're like, huh, we don't see anything in the lung. We don't see that mass. And so they, they bring the doctor in and the doctor's like, yeah, he looks and he's like, we're not saying it's gone. We think there still might be something there, but we're going to treat you like a normal pregnancy. You can have your baby in Aiken. You don't have to come down here. We'll, we'll do a scan of the little guy after he's born, about four or five months into his life, and we'll, we'll see and go from there. And so praise God that God has worked just truly amazingly, I believe, through this little guy. And what a, to what a story, if you know the herds, what a story of faithfulness on their part, and they haven't wavered in any way, and just what a blessing it is to see God at work in our world, even despite the crazy circumstances that we were in. And so uh, that was just when, when Adrian posted all that online one day on Facebook after they'd gotten this great news, it was just like, you know, goosebumps, tingles. It was like, whew, that was pretty neat. God is really at work and, and still continuing to do things. And that's why we pray. That's why we have a prayer list like this, uh, things to pray for. Mark and Vicki Daniels, uh, their daughter Shelley's expecting a baby as well, and not too far away, keeping her in prayer. We continue to pray for our buddy Russ. Uh, good to see you, Russ. I'm glad to see you here today. Continuing to pray for Dave Jensen. Dave's health has just always not, for a long time, not been the best, and we continue to pray for him. We continue to pray for Dan Madura. Uh, Dan continues just to have this battle, this ongoing struggle with cancer, and it's kind of it, it just like to, likes to ping pong through his body and they just keep fighting it here and they keep fighting it there and they keep trying to stay ahead of it and, and talk about a great attitude. Uh, most of you all know Dan really well, but the guy just has the best attitude about it and is, is, is so steadfast in his faith and, and really 
wonderful couple there, of course. And then, of course, praying for all who've been exposed or all who may be exposed or all who are struggling because of COVID, whether it's personally or indirectly, whether it's through work issues or all the other things uh, that it's impacted. Praying through all of those things. Uh, we continue to pray for Lachlan, who's uh, uh, Pastor Skog's grandson. Um, what's his first name, Pastor Skog? Wayne. I couldn't think. I had Ray in my head, and I couldn't get Wayne there. Uh, Wayne's grandson. And we've been praying for Lachlan, Lachlan, Lachlan for a year and a half, almost two years, probably maybe even a little longer than that. A little tight. He's got cancer. Fighting it. I think he's four or five, somewhere in that range. He's five. five now? He's five now? Okay, he's five. And, and has been fighting off cancer. And of course, you know, it's, it's, cancer's tough. We've all experienced cancer in some way, shape, or form, but when it's in your kid or in your grandkid, oh my goodness, you know. And, and so just for praying for that little guy that God would continue to work in his body and heal him because he's had some setbacks and it looks like he's going to need some more treatments and they're going to be doing a scan this week on his little body. So pray for his family and keep him in your thoughts. And then, of course, all the other things that are in our bulletin. Um, continue to pray for our missionaries. Something we don't think about probably as much as we should is the impact something like COVID-19 has on the greater world, right? We think about how it's inconvenient stuff. We think about, oh, I gotta wear the stupid mask, right? Or I've gotta, uh, I can't go there because now that's canceled or, you know. And we, we are certainly inconvenienced and, and, and it's uh, problematic and, and I don't wanna undersell the difficulty that COVID has caused for us. But I have friends who are missionaries in the Amazon basin in Colombia, for instance, where there's no medical treatment and, and there's no resources and, and things like COVID have just exploded and because of its you know, high level of contagiousness. It, it's just running rampant through places across the globe where they don't have the ability to slow it down or to social distance or all the other things. And so pray for our missionaries who are trying to love people in those contexts and, and the struggle and the challenge that's really creating for some of them. Um, continue to lift them up. And then all the other things are in our bulletin, plus many others. There's lots of stuff to be in prayer for. In addition to that, because I don't want to be Debbie Downer, there's so much to praise God for, right? We're here. It is one of the most beautiful mornings of the entire year. It was gorgeous out when I walked out of my house this morning, right? Just spectacularly beautiful. Blue sky, light breeze, Sun is shining, birds are chirping, as are the crickets, as you can hear. Uh, what a great day to be alive, and what a great time to be gathered together to get to make much of Jesus, right? So we do have an awful lot to give praise and thanks for. So I'm going to offer up some prayers, and then we're going to jump into the sermon. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your love. We thank you for each and every man, woman, and child who's either here or who will be watching us online. God, just pray your blessing upon them. Pray that you would help them grow in their faith. Pray that as we dig into the word that it would, would deepen us and, and that it would strengthen us. And, and God, you tell us that it does not return void. And so, Lord, as we invest ourselves uh, into the word of God, uh, may it find a great place in our hearts and, and may it enlighten us and, and may it, uh, Lord, lead our way and guide our paths for all of the days of our lives. God, we do lift up to you the many who are hurting, who are suffering mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. As we're going to see in the sermon today, God, that the world is broken by sin and there is much that is not the way that you created it to be, not the way that you want it to be. Yet, God, we have to deal with that because of our sin. And, and God, that experience is not always fun, where we have to worry about health or cancers or, or COVID or, or anything else, Lord, where we have to worry about finances or jobs or money just to pay rent or to buy groceries or, or worry just about uh, things that go on in the world, be it crime or riots or persecution or any of the other things, God. There's so much that we feel burdened by and worried about, and, and God, you are greater than all of this. And God, we need to put our hope and trust in you and not the things of this world. And God, we just pray for that as a constant reminder that we would continue to turn to you, that you would be our source 
and, and that truly, God, we would lean into that and that it would strengthen us and be our joy. God, again, we lift up to you all those we've mentioned and, and, and many others who are on our hearts, who need our prayers. You are a God who hears our prayers. You are not some distant God who, who is not in relationship, but you are a God who came to earth to walk among us, who, who knows us intimately, who hears our prayers and is active within that. And God, that is humbling that you would hear us, humbling that you would respond to us, humbling that you would bless us in that. And we are so thankful for your love in that. God, continue to be with us. Guide us, protect us, provide for us, and watch over us. Every day that we may draw breath, may we give you glory, honor, and praise in it. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We continue to have a growing online giving, and you can certainly, uh, as you exit, there will be an opportunity for tithes and offerings. Uh, we're not passing baskets in this current climate, but uh, you can leave those here, you can mail those in, or of course you can sign up online if you need help with getting connected online so that you have that so you can do that. And, and when you sign up online, it's pretty neat. You, you can specifically give to things like, you know, if you want X number of dollars to go to the deacons for the benevolence fund, there's an opportunity to do that. And, and for various projects, if it's our outside building project or uh, for our missions or other things, um, you, you have those abilities within that system to, to say, this is, this is what I'm doing. And, and then that all comes in and they are able to see that and make sure everything gets distributed properly. And really a safe system, um, really good system. Vanco is our provider. They do a great job. And uh, this is my second church now using them. I, I didn't pick them. I stayed out of that process. But uh, they, they are a reliable group. And uh, our, our church leaders who worked through that said, yeah, we agree. They are a good group. So it was originally my recommendation, but I had no say beyond that. But uh, if you need help with that, we'll do that. We, one of the things we did talk about at our annual meeting is uh, moving forward, doing communion. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing communion here fairly soon, and Al's going to be ordering some specialty communion supplies that we'll be able to uh, do that here in the not-too-distant future. So, so if you've been wondering and waiting when we'll get to do that again, uh, we're moving in that direction, and, and we're slowly moving. We're, we're going forward, and, and we're trying to do so in love with caution, but continuing to, to move towards um, some level of normalcy. And, and uh, we appreciate your grace as we stumble along through that. Uh, we're not perfect, and we are figuring it out as we go. Well, with that, we are going to be in the Bible once again. Surprise, right? Genesis, Genesis 3. So uh, you're certainly welcome to follow along. I'll read it for you. We will throw it up on the screen as well. And while it does say Genesis 1 through 7, I'm going to go all the way through 13 so we get this whole story here. This is going to be uh, a story you've, you've, you've heard before. But um, nonetheless, listen to it. It's the Word of God, and hopefully it will have uh, an impact on us as we go through it here today. So Genesis 3, 1 through 13, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in it in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, of course, a, a story we've all heard before, right? We've probably heard the story a bunch of times. You don't even have to grow up in church to probably have heard the story, right? It, it's the fall of man. Sin entered in. Sin came into the world. A perfect world broken by sin. Now in the New Testament, Paul, of course, confirms this idea for us as well, that sin came into the world through, through one man and thus death through sin. And, and that, of course, is a, a cardinal Christian doctrine, the doctrine we, we refer to as the doctrine of original sin. And if you don't know where that is in the New Testament, Paul sets that out very clearly. Romans 5, 12 is where you would find that. And for us, an understanding of this, this passage is absolutely essential to be able to understand the gospel because without an understanding of sin and our fault, we cannot understand God's grace. We cannot embrace God's grace. When, when God starts the Bible, it's really interesting, I think, that, that, that he first teaches us that he created us, right? And then he teaches us about sin. I think that probably says something to us uh, about how we should proceed when we share the faith with others. A uh, great book, if you've never read it, is a book called To Tell the Truth by Will Metzger. Um, in that book, he stresses that in our evangelism, as we share Jesus with others, as we share the gospel, we can't skip the doctrine of creation and we can't skip the doctrine of sin because the gospel is unintelligible if we don't understand the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of sin. If you don't understand that, that God made you and that, that God loves you, right, and that you owe an obligation to him because of that, if you don't understand that then you're never going to understand that, that you're a sinner in rebellion against him. You, you'll never understand what that means. The, the gospel will just be gibberish to you, right? It won't make sense. It's only when we understand our responsibility to God and the fact that we are estranged from him in our relationship because of our sin only then does the gospel begin to make sense. So before we can explain grace, we have to explain love and sin. Now this passage, of course, is about sin, which is a fairly depressing subject, right? But it's vitally important. And so I invite you along on this journey with me, and, and I think we'll make it all the way through 13 today, is my hope. And I want to look at this passage in three different parts. The first part is verses 1 through 5. Those verses recount for us the temptation. The second portion is verses seven, 6 and 7. And those verses recount for us the specific disobedience of, of Adam and Eve. And it begins to tell us about the consequences of that disobedience. And then we get to verses 8 through 13. And that's where God has this divine confrontation with Adam and Eve. And, and we see there the beginnings of the conflict between humanity and God and, and the, the beginnings of conflict in relationship between man and woman or between people, right, in, in the wake of their sin. And as I said, the, the first thing there, in that first portion of this passage, the first thing we learn about sin as we read through this is that sin is essentially lawlessness. If you're taking notes, that you're, that's your first note. We studied John here recently, and, and, and John talks about this in 1 John, actually, that sin is lawlessness. But John undoubtedly drew that definition right out of Genesis 3, right out of the, the teachings there and the teachings of the law and the prophets, uh, and, and then, of course, he saw this in the, the complex experience of, of life as well. 
And this is exactly how we find sin in this passage. It's lawlessness, right? It's rebellion. And, and I want you to note here as we are going through this in Genesis 3, right at the beginning of this, God's sovereignty is stressed, that God is the, in control, that God is the creator, that God is over all of that, right? Because in this passage, even the serpent who is in rebellion against him, the serpent is simply one of his creations. It's a creature. As we read Genesis 3, it reminds us that, that, that they did not have a concept back at the, to this time when it was written. There, there was no idea, there was no understanding, there was no belief that somehow good and evil were equal powers in the universe, right? That somehow Satan was equal to God. No, not at all. Satan is part of creation. Satan is not God. God is the one and only who is eternal and omnipotent, right? Satan and the serpent who is the instrument of Satan is merely a creation, a portion of God's creation. So there's no equality, there's no balance between the forces of good and evil. Evil is the rebellion of the creature against the creator. And that's how this is defined again and again throughout this passage. Now, as we read the story, right, we have this interesting thing going on. Now, I've worked in a lot of places. I've done a lot of things. I've seen a lot of snakes, right? I grew up in South Dakota. We have venomous rattlesnakes in western South Dakota primarily. I used to be a backpacking guide in New Mexico. I've hiked all across Colorado. I've seen rattlesnakes and poisonous snakes. I've seen water moccasins. I've seen cottonmouths. I've seen garter snakes. I've seen bull snakes. I've seen all kinds of different snakes in my life, right? Maybe you have too. How many of you have had a snake spark up a conversation? Yeah? Asking you about the weather. Oh, how's the weather? Oh, yeah, it's kind of kind of hot down here on the ground, right? No. no. None of us has ever had that experience, of course. And as we read this passage, the idea of an animal talking and tempting and arguing and eventually leading to Adam and Eve into sin, the idea behind that is for us, is meant to bring to mind as we read this, the weirdness of sin, the ridiculousness of sin, the outrageousness of sin, right? As, as we think about a talking snake being absurd, well, that's the point Moses is trying to make. The idea that we should sin should be even more absurd than that idea, right? That, that, that we should want to walk away. Imagine Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in perfection, right? Perfect in the Garden of Eden. Everything was provided for. Everything was wonderful. Everything was perfect. They got to walk around the garden having conversations with God himself, right? And now they're going to choose to sin. And, 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 and choosing sin over th that perfection is, is, is greater in its absurdity than some talking snake. That's Moses' point, if you've never caught that in this passage. The absurdity of sin, right? The weirdness of sin, the wrongness of sin. It's not supposed to be that way. Just like snakes aren't supposed to talk. And Adam and Eve have been given dominion over what, right? We've been studying this. Over all the animals. Now here is an animal leading Adam and Eve into sin. This should have been a, a, a bright, flashing, blinking red light. Right? Danger, danger, danger. 
snakes don't talk, danger, danger, right? If you're ever out on the tractor mat and one of the snakes starts talking, run, right? You don't, you don't hang out with that snake and have a conversation. It's not the way it's supposed to be. This should have been a warning for Eve when this talking snake comes into the garden and starts talking to her. There, there's no indication in the Bible that this was the way things were. Adam wasn't walking around having conversations with the lions, talking to the squirrels. He wasn't Dr. Doolittle, right? That wasn't the way things were. This was not the normal state of affairs. There were no talking snakes. There were no other talking animals. Now, of course, one other exception, which is also pointed out to be wildly weird, is in the book of Numbers. Balaam's donkey talks, right? And again, the point in that story is it points out that that is not the normal state of affairs. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And so when this talking serpent comes to Eve, there should have been some warning in her mind that something is wrong here. And that's the very reason that Moses gives us this account. It's the very reason he, he, he stresses this, to remind us how, how God's created order is turned upside down by sin. God made us to be in dominion over the animals. And when we rebel against God and say, we're going to do it our own way, what happens? We're put in subjection to the animals. Paul picks up on that same thing in, in Romans 1. He says that invariably, when we decide that we're going to throw off God and worship whatever we want to worship, what is it we end up worshiping? The things that creep and crawl. Beasts and animals. We don't become superhuman. We become subhuman. That's the story of original sin. It doesn't make us more human. It makes us less human. And that's one of Moses' reasons for stressing this to us in this account. Let me point out as well there in verse 1 that the tempter begins with an insinuation, right, instead of an argument. Satan doesn't start off immediately by contradicting God. At first, he asks a question which is meant to plant a seed of doubt in Eve's mind. He asks this question, if you're following, look at it again in, in verse 1. Did God, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Now understand that question. The tempter's purpose is not to question whether God said that or not. It's not a factual question. He's not saying, have I understood it correctly that God has said that? Or that he didn't say that. that. That's not the point. The point is this. The point is to plant in Eve's mind a seed of doubt about the wisdom and the fairness and the goodness of God. Is God good? Is God wise? Is God fair? Is what he did truly good for you? And the point is for, for Eve to ask the question, well, yeah, what does sound kind of unreasonable that he wouldn't let us eat from that tree, right? I mean, why can't we eat from that tree? She begins to, you know, have the opportunity for some doubt to enter in. I mean, why would God be so unfair and so unreasonable to restrict us? That doesn't sound like love to me. And the idea of the question is to plant in Eve this, this seed of doubt, this, this desire to question what God had done and why he had done it, and to put herself then in a place of judgment over God. And isn't that precisely where we find ourselves constantly when we're tempted by sin? We are judging that we know better than God, and so we are going to do it differently than God has said. And so Satan's purpose is to get Eve to question God's wisdom and God's judgment. It's as if Satan ha had said, did God really say that? Well, that's not wise. That's not good. That's not fair. 
Now, now as we're reading this, Eve's response, she begins to answer well, right? She starts off by saying, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. God has given us that promise. God has given us that blessing. Look at this amazing garden. It's got all this great stuff for us. God has blessed us, right? That, that should be the, the right answer. But Satan had, had twisted God's words. So Eve starts off by kind of contradicting Satan. No, we can eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. But then immediately thereafter, she gets off course, right? Look at verse 3. And notice what it says. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, right? Lest you die. Now Eve makes two mistakes in verse 3. First of all, she adds the phrase, right? You shall not touch it. That wasn't in God's prohibition at all. And then she goes beyond that and she makes God's command stricter than it actually was. Now there's a lot of people in life who, who think that if you can just go a little bit further than God's requirements, well then you can really get closer to holiness by doing that. This was the idea that the trap that the Pharisees fell into, right? But by doing this, as we saw with the Pharisees as you read the New Testament and their struggles, by, by, by going beyond what God says, it actually brings to us the reverse. Because to add to God's word is to take away from his authority. Just as much as to take away from God's word is to take away from his authority. Uh, an old theologian once said that as soon as we begin to add to the words of God, we will also begin to take away from the words of God. And so Eve here adds words to what God had said. And then she indicates a wrong motive for her obedience. Look again at verse 3. God has said, you will not eat from it or touch it lest you die, right? In other words, the motivation that she states to Satan for not eating of this tree is the motivation of self-interest. If we eat it, we die. That's not what God said in Genesis 2, though. Notice his command. He says in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat from it, you shall certainly die, or surely die. Death there is stated as a fact. Yes, it's a, a consequence of sin, but the reason that Adam was to obey that command was not because if you don't obey, you're going to die. The reason that Adam was supposed to obey that command was because God gave it to him. And this is an important difference, right? It's just like dad comes home from work or whatever, right? And, and, and mom has told the kids, you need to do this, whatever it is. Take the garbage out, clean your bedroom wash the dishes, walk the dog. And the kids come up to dad and they say, but dad, why do we need to do that? What's the right answer in that scenario? Because mom said so. Any other answer, dads? You're in trouble. The right answer is because mom said so. The reason you need to be obedient, son or daughter,
Now I have to talk with one hand. It's kind of like a snake. Um, anyhow, back to where I was. Eve, Adam, walking through the garden with God. It's perfect. It's wonderful. Snake comes along. Which one are you going to side with? Which one are you going to listen to? Of course, we all go, yeah, I'm going to listen to God, right? How many of you have sinned in the last 24 hours? Liars. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We like to think that we are better, but we're not. We like to think, oh yeah, I, 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 if I was walking with God in the garden, that's all I would do is walk with God in the garden. It would be perfect. It would be wonderful. But the problem is, we sin. She listens to the snake. Adam and Eve were to be God's covenant keepers and everything was perfect and it was their opportunity to step up to the, pl the plate and defend his authority. This was their opportunity to say to the snake, now hold on, wait a second. I don't know where you come from and I don't know how you're talking, but we're loyal to God. And this is what he said and that's what we're going to do. It was their opportunity to show their loyalty to God. And this is the crux of original sin. Instead of showing loyalty to God, they rebelled against God, right? This story is not about picking fruit. And by the way, it doesn't say an apple, if you were thinking it does. It just says a fruit. We've traditionally called it an apple because in a Western world, it's easy for us to understand. But this story is about loyalty to the commands of God versus rebellion against the commands of God. That's the crux of the story in Genesis 3. And I want you to note that the very first doctrine that was ever denied was the doctrine of judgment. You shall not surely die, Satan said, right? Don't think somehow that the modern idea, the modern denial of God's judgment and wrath, uh, the idea of hell, are, are anything new. The very first doctrine ever denied in the history of the world was the doctrine that God would one day set things straight. And it's not surprising that this was the very first point of attack where Satan attacks God's word. And then in verse 5, we see now that, that Satan has gotten Eve off course, right? And he brings out the big guns. He brings out the big lie. God is trying to keep you from this because if you had it, you would be like him right? God, God is holding you back. God is holding you down. He's keeping you from reaching your full potential, right? And sadly, they buy that story hook, line, and sinker. God had blessed them beyond imagination. They were the most blessed people in the history of the world. Moses wants us to see how ridiculous that is, right? Because it's just as ridiculous as I mentioned the degree that God has blessed us. So frequently, we forget about that, don't we? So frequently, we don't see how abundantly God has blessed us. We see that one thing that's a problem or that one thing we can't have or that one thing we can't do. And, and, and we forget all about all the blessings we're ungrateful because of that one thing. And we, like Adam and Eve, rebel against it. We are guilty of this too. Notice how Satan puts a wall between holiness and happiness. He's in effect saying, your adherence to God's standards is going to keep you from true fulfillment, from true happiness, from true satisfaction. If you will reject God's standards, you will finally find full and true happiness. You will be completely satisfied, right? That's always Satan's strategy. He's always saying, if you follow those rules that God gave you, it's going to ruin your life. Whereas God tells us that there is an inseparable connection between holiness and happiness between obedience and satisfaction, between doing the will of God and receiving a blessed eternal reward. 
Never forget that, that Satan will always work against you, trying to get you to buy the lie that holiness will keep you from happiness. The truth could not be farther from that. Only in holiness can we find perfect happiness. Now quickly, let's move on to to verses 6 and 7. We've already learned that sin is lawlessness. It's a rebellion against God, right? In verses 6 and 7, we learn that sin always carries with it shame. Sin always carries with it shame. That's your second note if you're keeping notes. In verses 6 and 7, we see the disobedience of Adam and Eve acted out. And we see its immediate consequences. Here, the the covenant keepers in the garden rebel against God. Notice again in verse 6, this downward spiral of sin. Look at the phrases there. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired and to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What a mess we make, right? What a mess we make of things. She saw, she took, she ate, she gave, he ate, and their eyes were opened. They knew, they covered, and they hid. Do you see how sin begins to pull them down, down, down? Did, did eating of that fruit make them gods? Oh, no. It drags them down to the very gates of hell. And that's the very first thing that sin does. And we know that by how we experience sin in our own lives, how, how sin can wrap us up like that, right? At first, it's just one little sin, and then it's another, and then it's another, and then it's another. And pretty soon, we don't know how to extract ourselves from that sin. So pretty soon, we are creating other sins to cover up the first sins, right? And, and we're trying to extract ourselves, but we're only digging the hole deeper, Right? And we keep going lower and lower and lower, not getting ourselves closer to redemption, but closer to condemnation. That's what sin does to us. Clouds our minds, causes confusion, points us in the wrong direction, and that's exactly how the very first sin was. Notice again in this passage the unexpected consequences which land on Adam and Eve. It says that their eyes were opened. We find that they are enlightened in the most horrifying way. They, for the very first time in all of their lives, see nakedness. But get this, it's not the lack of clothing. It's the shame because of what they have done. And now they can see it and realize what they have done and what has changed. For the very first time in the human experience, they are experiencing shame. That one will be okay. And of course, they rightly sense then in their shame the need for covering. But their attempt is feeble, of course, right? Fig leaves. Are fig leaves going to solve your shame Can you imagine sinning, whatever you sin, however you've sinned most recently? Whatever you did against God, somehow maybe you thought something mean or you said something wrong or you did something or whatever it was you did, however you've most recently sinned, imagine you went outside and grabbed a bunch of oak leaves and tried to sew them together and put them over your sin. Would that work? That's what Adam and Eve were trying to do. It wasn't about body parts. It was shame. Their eyes were opened and they realized what they had done. We can't hide our sins from God. And when we attempt to do so, we fail miserably, just like Adam and Eve. Notice again that that freedom is found only in holy constraint. Satan had told Adam and Eve that true freedom and true happiness is only found when you can decide whether you're going to do what God tells you to do or whether you're going to decide not to do what God tells you to do. That is the freedom. That's free will. Getting to choose, am I going to obey God or not? That is freedom. And this passage makes it 
clear that true freedom is not, in fact, doing what you want to do, but rather true freedom is living in God's will for our lives. Not my will, but yours be done, right? But so frequently, we don't live that way. One last thing, and we'll finish up here. Look at verses 8 through 13. Not only does sin carry with it shame, but sin disrupts the fellowship between God and man and man and mankind, right? Sin disrupts relationships. That's your third note. Here we see in the the wake of the rebellion in verses 8 through 13, we see that. Verse 8 speaks of a fellowship which has been lost, a, a sense of estrangement and enmity. Man is hiding because of his sin. And God questions him in in verse 9, right? And and as God questions him, it's it's actually a showing of God's grace as God gently attempts to draw Adam into an awareness of the magnitude of what he has done. God could have come into the garden with thunder and lightning and zap, 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 burned him to the ground if he wanted to, right? Right? but he doesn't. God instead comes to the garden asking some questions. Not because God didn't know the answer to these questions, right? But because he's trying to draw Adam out of the mire which he has created. Verse 10 gives us Adam's response to God's question. Adam says, yeah, I uh, heard the sound of you in the garden, God, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Do you know that's the very first mention of fear in the Bible? Notice the consequences of sin. Fear, shame, and isolation. That's an ugly trinity of evil. That's what sin brings. Fear, shame, and isolation. Of course, the blame shifting then begins in in verse 11 through 13, right? God comes to Adam first. Why? Why? Because Adam was the covenant head. In the, in the story, Adam came first, and he was first in covenant with God. He was the representative. He was being held responsible by God. It's interesting that God doesn't start with the serpent. He starts with Adam. And this isn't a, a, a devil made me do it kind of scenario, right? God goes first to Adam, and he says, why did you do this, Adam? Notice immediately what Adam does. It's because of the woman you gave me, right? Does he take personal responsibility for his behavior? No. It's because the woman you gave me, she gave me this to eat. No, he's putting the blame on God. He's putting the blame on Eve. He's not taking responsibility for his actions. I did it because of you guys. Then God goes to the woman. Why'd you do this? I did it. Because that serpent that you made gave it to me. The blame shifting has already begun. And let me say that also in this moment, the isolation between Adam and Eve, the brokenness of human relationships has also begun. Look at verse 10. God has just, Adam, God has just asked Adam, where are you? Here's his answer. He says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Where's Eve? Adam and Eve were walking through the garden together with God everywhere before, right? They were together, hand in hand, arm in arm, everywhere they went. They they were together. Now he says, I hid myself, right? Just a second ago, they were a couple. Just a second ago, they were together and everything. Now he's alone hiding in the bushes. Isolation has already begun in the human experience right there because of sin. In this passage, God teaches us that sin is rebellion and that sin carries with it shame and that sin disrupts both the divine and human relationships as well as human to human relationships. And in this passage, we have the basis of understanding why the return to fellowship with God is going to cost the blood of his one and only son. And I hope that you hear that truth today. For if we grasp that, 
then we've grasped everything. Let's pray. God, again, we thank you for these words, even though at times, Lord, studying sin and original sin is not always comfortable because we don't like to examine our sin. We don't like to look at it. We don't like to admit, many of us, Lord, that we aren't perfect. And God, when we search our hearts and when we see that we, like Adam and Eve, we've gone astray, that we have broken that relationship, Yes, God, we are tainted by the original sin, but God, beyond that, we've chosen to sin. We are culpable, each and every one of us. We have sinned and fallen short of your glory. And God, that creates a problem, creates a barrier between us and you. Not the one that you've created, it's one that we have created by breaking the covenant And God, I pray on this day, each and every person who hears my voice, whether it's now in this place or in somewhere in the world as they are listening to it, that they would know that indeed sin is a problem and that we are the problem. And because we are the problem, we are not the solution to the problem because we keep sinning. We keep making the mess. We keep making things worse. We don't make things better. But God, you didn't leave us in that mire. You didn't abandon us. You didn't forsake us. You didn't leave us behind in our mess of our own making. Instead, you wanted to bridge that gap. You wanted to heal that relationship. You wanted to bring us back into relationship with you. And you did so by sending your son, Jesus. And we are oh so thankful for that, that Jesus had come to the earth and live as we have lived and walk among us, but to live a perfect life and to die a perfect death, to satisfy, so that we might return to you, so that we might be back in fellowship with you. Thank you for his blood. Thank you for his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you that Jesus was willing to bridge the gap for us. God, we all confess our sins. We admit we are sinners in need of a Savior. We humbly come before you asking that you would be the Lord of our lives. Guide us, guard us, and protect us as we move forward from here. Give us the strength to be open and honest with you, to repent and to turn away from all that we have done that is wrong, and to know that your mercies are new each and every day. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that you have done. It is in this high and holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. It is a blessing to see you either here in person or online. And I pray that as you go, you would go forth, not condemned by sin, but freed by the God who loves you through the grace of Jesus Christ. And everywhere you go, share that love with all you would encounter. Go and serve your King. Thanks for coming. See you soon. God bless.